The subject of the day is meditation. But first of all, I'd like to point out that this is not intended as a criticism or as an expose or to depreciate in any way the importance of metaphysical, mystical disciplines. It is, however, more or less obvious every day that some of these processes and practices are being abused, others are completely misunderstood, and a number of very sincere and honorable persons have gotten themselves into profound emotional and mental disturbances as a result of trying to practice these disciplines. It therefore seems important to try to help to clarify this particular subject for the benefit of Western people. In the first place, Western man is not by nature a meditating being. It takes almost all the effort he can exert to even try to develop these aspects of his consciousness and his mind. He has approached religion, truth, and God for over 2,000 years, almost completely devotionally. And this is very important. But the devotional love of deity has become the approach with which we are familiar and is expressed largely through prayer. Prayer is important. It is vitally important. But technically, it is not the same thing as meditation. Prayer is an approach on a purely devotional basis. And here again, Western people have difficulties. We are not even used to being simply devotional to anything. Well, perhaps we have a certain extreme fondness for ourselves, but it doesn't really reach the standard of true devotion. The individual lives in a physical world, and the rapid development of physical conditions in the Western world has resulted in an almost completely intellectual point of view and has caused us to trust the mind more, perhaps, than we should. Now, the mind is a very useful instrument, but the idea that we are born and endowed with a superlative intellect for no reason and that it will serve us well without any effort on our own part is simply not true. The mind itself, as the Oriental says, can be the slayer of the real. And the intellect has produced most of the miseries that have afflicted the whole world, and especially the Western Hemisphere, for the last 2,000 years. The actual problem of the intellect has to be carefully considered. Now, we are all born with minds of various specializations and various degrees of development. Any school teacher can point this out to you. Aptitudes in various areas become important in the education of the individual. But the one aptitude that we have not noticed very much of in recent years is the aptitude of meditation. We do not have the basic foundations for a meditative life. In fact, we would be a little afraid to attempt it because it could so easily end in physical hazards and detriments. So in the working with the individual and the person working with himself has to realize that his mind is a specialized instrument. It is peculiarly his own. It has limitations which he has to discover. It can, to certain degrees, be improved, changed, or modified. The memory can help us to maintain the knowledge of an art or a science. But every mind has its own boundaries. And where we attempt to break through these boundaries, we always 
find difficulties. For example, we can take specialized talents. An individual who is tone deaf will never do well trying to learn a musical instrument which must be tuned by himself. An individual who has actually little or no sense of composition is not going to be a good artist, no matter how hard he tries. Each individual uses the faculties that he possesses, and these faculties instinctively impel him in one direction or another. He finds, perhaps, that instead of being an artist or a musician, that he is a writer, or that he can be a scientist. It depends not only upon his choice, but gradually upon the ability of his faculties to support his decision. If the mind does not want that specialty, it's going to be very hard to be successful in attaining advancement in the field, that field of learning. Now, in also very often a case to realize that people on various levels of thinking, uh, have bodies, minds, and emotions brought together in a happy pattern. There are persons who will live their entire lives in a kind of natural affection. They will love their friends, their children, they will enjoy pets, they will work for a harmonious home, and over every other consideration is this desire for a gentle, constructive, happy relationship with life. Others are dominated by ambitions, and the pressure of the mind leads them sometimes into tragedy. Everywhere we turn, we find that the mind of the person fits with the body that he inhabits. His mind sort of goes with his total personality and is the basis of it. His mind tells him about what he ought to be doing, how he should think, what he can accomplish, and how he can enrich his life. Now, there are differences uh, in persons, but these different differences are not necessarily advancements or deficiencies. The individual who loves flowers and wishes to be a botanist is doing just as well as someone else who wishes to go into astronomy or mathematics. The natural aptitudes of the person must be considered. If he goes against them, his health suffers. His career is apt to be frustrated. And if the uh, frustration is sufficient, he may become neurotic or even psychotic because he is a square peg in a round hole. He doesn't fit into the life he has assumed, therefore it brings him no true satisfaction and no happiness. This is because the mind will not support it. It does not fit into the career the person has selected. Now, because the mind has this power, the problem of educating it requires a very wise advance in technologies. We can use the mind to educate us and ourselves and each other, but to find the proper in internal chemistry so that the mind becomes the natural, happy, healthy leader of the life and guardian of the health and protector of happiness. These achievements require considerable consideration. Now, we have another point here that is very important, and that is the grand scheme of the life way with which we are involved. At this particular time in the life of Western peoples, everything is extremely stressful. Competition is intensive. And the individual uses the mental faculties improperly. He uses them improperly because he feels that he must, that there is no way of achieving the success or security that he wants without using his mind to advance his fortunes. Therefore, first thing we know, he begins to cause the mind to become ill. The mind is uncomfortable and unhappy. It cannot properly guard the body over which it has a certain rulership. 
It cannot make the life full of achievements that are natural to the heart's desire. And the mind gradually becomes a hazard. It breaks homes. It destroys optimism and integrities, leads to corruption and crime, and ultimately can destroy a nation or an individual. With this type of thing, it becomes obvious that certain special methods have to be used if we want to have the spiritual benefits of right thinking. We have tied meditation very closely with religion, sometimes with mystical philosophy, but it mostly has to do with something about the inner life. And the, exactly the definition of it, in fact, is very difficult. We are not at all able to define it because in each person its function is different. There are variations. It's no more possible to impose one formula of mental growth upon an individual than it is to give every person who lives the same antibiotic pills. Each individual must explore himself. So I think perhaps we begin the processes of meditation not by a discipline but by a survey. We begin to think about what we need, what we really want to accomplish of permanent good, how much our idealism is going to be strengthened, to what degree we may come into complications as the result of our decisions, and all in all, what is the mind going to do to help us if we wish to use it in a meditational way? Well, of course, meditation implies quietude. It, inquire, it implies the individual no longer beset by internal mental instability. In other words, as one scholar said some years ago, the mind can no longer be considered merely a tumbling ground for whimsies. But with many people it is. Many people make up their own mental lives without any consideration for the mind's needs or, or attitudes. Some allow it to become the basis of a frivolous relationship with life. It becomes a doctrine of, or a teacher in fallacies, in abuses, misuses, and irresponsibilities. But most of all, the mind left to itself will behave itself reasonably well if the life in general is governed by common sense. The mind will cooperate with the normal attitudes of the person. It can do this quietly, peacefully, and cooperatively. But when the attitudes of the person become confused, then the mind is at a disadvantage. Therefore, the normal function of the mind of the human being de demands a normal life in which the human being uses his faculties, powers, and abilities as nature intended him to, and not as the programs for success and affluence have impelled him to attempt. If the person is normal, the mind will be pretty reasonable. It will take care of itself and it will help the individual to live. The mind in the normal person is a happy mind. It is a constructive factor. It is at peace with itself. It accepts itself as that self is, and it is constantly impelling to minor but valuable constructive idealistic impulses. So if this is not the case with the person, and he is, for instance, seeking some form of religion that is going to improve his own inner life, it is time for him to consider what this inner life is. Now, some systems of meditation advise the person to reduce the mind to a blank. Later we'll say why we don't really believe that is best. But if we can release the mind from stress and pressure and allow it to be quiet, if the inner life of the person 
the life that surfeits in sleep, in dreams, the life that causes anxieties and, and causes responsibilities to become enormous, the life which is competitive, has grievances with others, is subject to jealousy and greed, that is gossipy and hateful, if these things are in the individual's construction at the moment, it is going to be impossible for him to approach deity successfully until he corrects his own faults. In other words, before he can go into a mystical way of life, he must take care of the common faults of daily living to the best of his ability. An effort to do this conscientiously is a proof of sincerity. The person who is willing to change for the better and give up things which perhaps he has enjoyed because they were not good for him. This individual is sincere, and the beginning of wisdom is sincerity. It has to come first. So you can take yourself and see what would be necessary in order to have a quiet, benevolent, peaceful, che cheerful relationship with your own thinking. If your thinking is constantly negative, if you're constantly fearing something, if your anxieties and antagonisms are rising to every emergency, and if the common affairs of life are nothing but interruptions to what you want to be doing, then go to work on the mind. And this people have done since the time of Pythagoras. Uh, the contemplative disciplines of Pythagoras were not the type of meditation we think of today. Retrospection was a process, a process of going back over the daily life and finding out what the mistakes were and what the consequences of those mistakes were. This retrospective exercise helps the individual to control himself. It places him in an educational relationship with his own thinking. He begins to see the things that he paid no attention to before. Sometimes when he said something unpleasant, he just wanted to forget it and laugh it off and keep on being unpleasant. But retrospection will gradually show him that this will cost him his friends, his job, his family, and his own self-respect if he does not correct it. So retrospection was putting the life in order, restoring the validity of natural law over human conduct. Retrospection brought the individual to know what the universe intended him to be. It doesn't necessarily make him that immediately, but it d discovers for him what his own potential actually can be. The contemplative exercises of the Pythagoreans were of a different note. Contemplation was a form of concentration. Contemplation was a search for meaning in things. Uh, contemplation might cause the thoughtful person to sit quietly in his garden and allow the flowers to speak to him, at least in a symbolic way. Contemplation was the looking out for value. It was to get beneath the surface of things that appear superficial and find out the reason for them. Contemplation also helped to put things in order. It helped the individual to gradually gain spiritual strength. The final contemplation is the contemplation of life itself, which in its own way gives us a new sense of relationship with divinity and our fellow man. Concentration was another discipline which was taught by the ancient Greeks. This was very good because it helps the person to achieve continuity in his own effort. The individuals who are scattered in their thinking, who start many things and finish few of them, Individuals who get tired of something very quickly or begin to cast it aside because it becomes increasingly difficult. Where concentration is lacking, the person does not have any depth of purpose. He does not know how to unfold his own faculties. 
Lack of concentration can make a bad student in school and make a bad housewife, a bad businessman, and a dangerous leader in society. So concentration is to stay with it until you finish it. And if you don't want to finish it, don't start it. Because to go halfway along and give it up for something else, or move from one sect to another in religion, or from one level of belief to another without having conquered anything, without having fulfilled any essential purpose, the, dis the discontinuance of action because it becomes increasingly difficult. This is a discipline the Pythagoreans were very fond of. They liked to get this discipline of continuity, that everything must be done to the proper end, for it is only when the complete pattern is revealed that the law is evident in the particular task that has been assumed. Now these were the, the, the disciplines of the Greeks, and to a large degree they were finally found their way into uh, Neoplatonic philosophy and uh, with certain reservations and changes into the Gnostic uh, doctrines. Uh, these combined both Eastern and Western thinking. But they constituted a method, more or less Western, a method which could be organized, it could be rationalized in one way or another, and uh, might bring the individual in gradually into a state of self-sufficiency, self-security, and make the individual capable of running his own life effectively. Now, on the other side of the meditative problem, we come upon the Asiatic approach. Asia is the other side of a great coin, and the other side in this case means that the Eastern Hemisphere has been from the very earliest times more associated with inner life, inner dedications, and the development of internal resources than Western man. The Eastern thinker is concerned with what he is. The Western thinker is more apt to be concerned with what he has. Now, the Orient has produced many different systems of religion and, in a sense, magic, because in the Eastern systems, Tantra and things of this nature come into a strange combination of religion and transcendentalism. But the one gradually evolving fact that we perceive is that it's quite impossible to say that all of any nation represent the best part of that nation. There are just as many mistakes in Asia as there are here, but they are different mistakes. And unfortunately, we are teaching them ours. But they're getting it a little back of us because they are giving us some of their mistakes also. <laughs> and this interchange is especially complicated in matters of religion. Religion, basically, is at the foundation of nearly all efforts of the human being to grow. Religion has been with us since the beginning of known history. It goes back beyond any measure of time that we possess on the earth and its cycles. But religion basically has as its one primary purpose, that man shall come into harmony with the divine plan of which he is a part. Religion is the veneration of deity and the veneration of those principles which we associate with the will of deity. So religion becomes very important, but to the measure that the individual develops external interests, to the same degree he is inclined to weaken his religious principles. Instead of having perfection of the inner life as its ultimate goal, Western man has been inclined to view this life as transitory many of the most successful from the standpoint of economic progress do not even believe in a deity or the immortality of the human soul. It is all tied to a fulfillment of ambition and appetite right here in this life. Now, such an individual in that condition is a very poor candidate for esoteric disciplines. 
even if he attempts them, about the only thing he can accomplish is to misuse them. So with the East, however, up to very recently, and still to some degree it remains, the child from birth lived in a world recognized as permeated by a very lofty and wonderful relationship between existing things and the sources of existence. The deities were very important to the child mind in the East. The parent was, of course, the example. And where the family was firmly religious and held its principles, even though these principles might disagree with our convictions, that uh, conviction of theirs was passed on down from one generation to another, and the child inherited the family wisdom with its mother's milk. This condition meant that by the time the child was 10 or 12 years old, and the problems of adjustment to social responsibility began to take shape, there was a strong reservoir of integrities in the term of the faith of the family. Also, the community held that faith. Religion was important in the life of the people. And those of simple station, who had no great ambitions, but expected to remain farmers or artisans for the rest of their lives and for many generations, this simple religious conviction pattern provided an all-sufficient guide to protect the individual from his own shortcomings and preserve him in the faith with which he, or in which he was born. Now, among these Indian faiths, the greatest of all points in life was that the individual should regain his spiritual awareness of his relationship with truth, with reality, and with God. It was assumed that he would be doing the things he had to do he would start in life, he would have debts, the very debt of birth would hang over him. These debts he must pay. So the first thing, perhaps, that we can take as a background in the Oriental approach is fulfillment. Religion was the fulfillment of duty. No religious person who wanted to be considered religious would be out to evade the normal burdens of living. He was supposed to achieve the lesser before he assailed the greater. So the individual started life in debt. He was in debt to his parents who had brought him into this world. He couldn't pay them because it's quite, quite possible that by the time he got into a condition where he could have repaid them, they weren't here any longer. He could honor their memories, he could respect the things they had done, but he could not pay his parents for what they had given him. But he could balance the debt by bestowing the same virtues in the training of his own children. As he was born, he had been given an opportunity for birth. It was therefore his duty to give other souls their opportunity for birth. So he paid his debt to his parents by becoming a parent and filling all the duties and responsibilities of, of parenthood. He also fulfilled the social problem of work. Every normal person must make a contribution in support of the cost that he is to the world in which he lives. It isn't only the financial problem. It is the earth that gives him bounty. It is the air, the sea, flowers, birds, everything contribute to his well-being. Therefore, he has a duty to perform, and that is to make a religion of contributing to the well-being of all that lives. There was no virtue in running away from it. No strength in escape. The real path was to work until the work was finished. And when that work is finished and the individual has made every duty a fulfilled responsibility, then 
he may think of himself a little more. Only afterwards, never before. And in thinking of himself, perhaps he will choose to go into a religious life. Because after he has finished with the duties of this world, it is his proper duty in the terms of his philosophy and his religion to prepare himself for that which lies beyond the grave. He should not go into the other world completely unequipped. He should not be able uh, to wonder what is going to happen to him. He should be firm in the realization that a good life and a proper dedication will prepare him for transition. And that then becomes the problem of becoming accustomed in his own mind to transition so that the fear of death no longer perturbs him in any way. It is only another step in the unfoldment of the great picture. It is only another degree in the evolution of human life. Having come to these conclusions, this individual might be said to be a being adjusted to a contemplative life adjusted to what might be termed meditation, which is actually the individual's ability to use the inner resources of his life in a constructive manner. Now, if the mind is trying to do what is right, and the individual who has it jogs it along with all kinds of compromises and delinquencies, the mind, which is not a spirit in itself, but it's a kind of a genie kept in a bottle. The mind says, all right, you want a million dollars? I'll help you get it. And the mind will favor us in almost everything we want. But in the end, those kind of favors which the mind bestows are not permanent, have no essential significance. And when the great time comes when the individual must leave this world, he goes utterly unprepared and probably frightened to death. So he can make the mind do as he pleases. He can sign a pact with it as Faust signed a pact with Mephisto. But in the end, it will end in tragedy because the mind is then being used improperly because the individual has attitudes that are basically improper themselves and he wants the mind to help improve them. This is why all different kinds of schools of thought can be proven by dedicating the mind to the acceptance of, a, of reports, opinions, and beliefs. The mind can cause us to accept a philosophy and fight to the death to defend it when in substance there's nothing to it in the first place. So the mind is tricky. And in, in an effort to get this trickiness out of it, we must stop abusing it and use it as it was intended. So the uh, process of the religious dedication in life finally becomes the fulfillment of a life pattern in which everything the individual has done all through the years strengthens the integrities which he wishes to exp expand or enlarge. It becomes a new way and a full, fuller way of growing the next step towards relationship with the infinite. Now, after you get these thoughts in mind, you pick up the book of somebody and you read about a very special discipline uh, which very much remind me of these discipline things sometimes are very similar to diets. Uh, Every one you get is the perfect one. If you want to reduce, there are 17,000 ways of doing it. But in the final analysis, all of these different paths and ways and so forth are simply excuses for something. Their validity is only to the degree that they are supported by the quiet mind and the peaceful heart. There can be no value in any exercise of a religious nature which does not conform with the daily dedications of the person. The integrities must come first. 
the individual is not going to become spiritual through the disciplines, but his spirituality can make the disciplines possible. It is a different approach from what we are accustomed to. So when you think you've found a nice new way to get better and better, quicker and quicker, it is a good plan to sit down for a moment and say, do I deserve it? If I, am I trying to do this in order to advance my real life, or am I trying to get, or get, evade some present responsibility that I don't enjoy? Anyone who is neurotic and takes on disciplines is going to get in trouble. Trouble comes where they are used as substitutes for integrities, where the individual really believes that by keeping quiet for half an hour, all the sins of his life will be forgiven, has missed the point, because all the virtues of his life are the only things that make that half hour important. And longer and longer periods of meditation are for the most part escape mechanisms. They are the individual trying more and more to escape from the consequences of his own thoughts, emotions, and conduct. He is trying to get away from the self that is himself and change it for a divine self which he hopes lurks somewhere in the background. But if he does not make the adjustments first, the whole program is frustrated. Meditation, like prayer, is an expression of a devout of a devout and dedicated heart. Without that first, uh, there will be no consequences worthwhile. Yet the mind can convince us of anything. The mind can convince us that these things are important just as much as it convince us, can convince us that we should all learn French. These things are part of mental attitudes, the result of our own thinking patterns. So we can support a meditative discipline but with the mind, and yet at the same time never have the facts of the matter. We can be, follow the exercises prescribed by some writer or in some book, but these exercises do not touch the realities. They do not get beyond the mental lock with which we have bound ourselves to a way of life that is not constructive or useful or valuable to us. All these outer things only become offerings brought to the altar of our deity. We bring the flowers of our noble works. We bring the fruit of our dedication. We bring the prayers of our lips and the meditations of our hearts. But they are only gifts that we bring. We have to earn them ourselves. We have to do the things in the way that they should be done. Now, the whole theory of meditation is essentially the, the realization that if we become normal enough inside ourselves, if we dispose of everything that is artificial, that which remains is reality. Now, the idea of making the mind a blank is not what we are supposed to be doing. The moment we do this, we open ourselves to psychic phenomena, which can become a very blind alley. And it can cause all kinds of self-delusions. And a great many persons suffer bitterly from the fact that they overestimate their own degree of spirituality. They think they are doing it right. They believe that they are serving truth. They are convinced that the system that they are following is God-ordained. But in the long run, they end in a neurotic tangle, very often incurable. So it is very much uh, more to the point to recognize that we are not trying to make the mind a blank. What we are trying to do is to bring the mind to the point where it has already disposed of its own mistakes very largely. The mind used in connection with meditation can hallucinate tremendously if it hasn't been cleansed first. It can dramatize things we have read, things people have told us, 
ancient symbols until there is no end to what it will do in flooding us with various misrepresentative uh, elements. But when the mind is right, it does not do this. It remains quiet and at peace and allows something else to gradually take over. Behind the mind, as we know it in our daily thinking, we have the higher structure of the human being. The principles, the divine part of nature, the mind's higher aspects, the soul, uh, the spirit, and its relation to the cosmos, all these things lie above the level of the mind. But the mind can gradually be relaxed to the point that the individual can appreciate or perceive or reflect upon some of these higher principles. But these higher principles are also masked by all kinds of pseudo-psychical phenomena. The only safe answer to the whole problem is that the person must have cleansed the mind before he can depend upon it. The mind can be a servant of reality, but it can also be a servant of delusion. If the individual has not properly balanced his own sense of values, the mind will keep on helping him cheat himself. It will continue to confront him with the delusions of his own believings and of the sects, creeds, and groups with which he has been associated. He cannot achieve his final purpose until he transcends uh, the illusions of life. Now, on the other hand, nature has its own peculiar way of doing things. The individual who frustrates nature simply because he believes frustration is a virtue is also headed into trouble. He is not supposed to go contrary to the simple laws of life. Religion is a fulfillment, not a frustration. The individual does not gain his ends by suffering the loss of the things he likes. Rather, he gains his ends by enjoying the things he has learned to know are best. He is not giving up something he cherishes. He is giving up a false belief in placing a true one in its stead. Therefore, there is no problem of frustration. Many religious groups and individuals start their inner lives by leaving the world behind. But it only ends up in one thing. The world leaves them behind. Fulfillment means that every duty, every reasonable problem, must be faced and met. No one can run away from responsibility and substitute meditation for daily labor. It must be a problem of proper fulfillment of each step of the way until we take care of the small things that are with us always. We will not be given care over the greater things. Unless we meet the responsibilities of this world, we will not have higher state in the one beyond. So always remember, do not run away from trouble. Do not attempt to get away from this awful, terrible, pernicious environment in which we are all involved and for which, to a degree, we are all responsible. Therefore, to get peace by simply escaping physical problems is a complete delusion. Peace is not settled or centered in physical things. Peace is inside yourself. And until you find it there, you can never get rid of discord. There's only one way. It's all right if the individual uh, wishes uh, on occasion uh, to do a retreat for spiritual uh, nutrition, to get away from a complication for a week or two weeks or something of that nature, but not as a major change in life. There are things you can do, however. You may find it possible 
to find another busy group of people who are doing the things that we all should do, and you can join with them in doing these things. But to try to get away from trouble simply by walking out on it is a common mistake that we should all avoid in every way possible. And also, when you get to work along with this type of thing, we try to find out a little more about the attitude of the mind in problems of meditation. How are we going to approach it? I suppose the simplest approach to it is the gradual refinement of the principle of prayer. Prayer, however, is a constant demand. Prayer is the individual requiring something. It is the individual asking the divine power to fulfill his own personal needs or to place himself at the mercy of the Lord in problems he should be taking care of with his own personal resources. Therefore, the old idea that prayer should only be a request or a demand or that it is perfectly right and proper to ask anything you want to in a universe of infinite potential. These ideas belong to a rather uncontrolled mental approach to life. Actually, prayer should be, as it was in ancient times, a hymn of gratitude. If we must have a mat an attitude towards the universe in which it l we exist, it should be an attitude of gratitude. The only reason is not what it ought to be, is our own action. We have been given everything necessary, every resource. We have been given faculties to meet almost any conceivable circumstance with which we can become involved. We should be grateful for the privilege of growing. We should be grateful for the privilege of sharing. We should be very much more happy when we give something than when we gain it. We should recognize ourselves as uh, citizens in what Buddha called the great community, the great universal mystery of life, that we are magnificent creatures, incredibly skilled, that we are here for something much more important than to go out and get killed in an auto accident. We are also here to realize that to have may be necessary to a degree, but that over-possession defeats the very reason for our existence. We should live simply, quietly, and moderately. And by gradually moderating the excesses of our own appetite, we come nearer and nearer, nearer to the great quietude of true Zen, or true meditational discipline. It is not an asking, it is a recognizing of all the things for which we should be grateful. It is a, an, an, opportuni an opportunity for us to express mentally or even physically our tremendous respect for the great plan of which we are a part and a rededication of ourselves to the service of that plan. And the search for knowledge should be gathered on the same basis. We should not use the mind to accumulate only that which cannot survive the grave. We should not use the mind constantly and only for temporal things or for personal pleasures. We can have the pleasures, but we should understand them. We should realize that a true pleasure is an experience of reality, that in some gentle way we have found the truth of a thing. But where a, treasure, where a pleasure is an extravagant intemperance, it has no relationship whatever to the growing of the person. So all the way along we have the constant problem of fitting ourselves into an attitude of realization in which pessimism, as we know it, is practically impossible. How can we be a pessimistic in a universe of eternal benevolence? How can we doubt the legality of a creation in which even the smallest fragment is a magnificent masterpiece of lawfulness? How can we doubt the realities? Maybe the mind can help us to see some of them 
and in that way it contributes to our improvement. When we become increasingly conscious of the wonders of existence, our faith grows equivalently. And yet I know people who have watched many wonderful films dealing with nature and nature studies, and at the end of the uh, experience they have nothing. They wonder a little at the fact some of these creatures are quite unusual, and that's the end of it. There is no recognition of the majesty of these forms of life. There is no realization that there's only one answer, and that is an infinite life, an infinite wisdom, and an infinite love ruling all things. And meditation should be a quiet restatement of these values in ourselves. It should be a process by which we correct any fear that might have arisen in the mind, that constantly meditation is putting us back in order. It is giving us again the full use of the power of discrimination. Meditation actually must be accompanied by wonder, by awe, by the incredible recognition of our environment. They say that one of the first emotions of small children is wonder. They open their eyes to an unbelievable state of things. The very wise person, dedicated to the highest achievements of faith, opens his inner eyes to a universe of infinite wonder, a universe in which all good things are possible, and where ignorance alone stands between the individual and the enrichment of his own life. Now some might say that perhaps the universe should never have bestowed upon man faculties that he could have used. Yes, but then there is something else to be said. Somewhere in the infinite future of things, each individual is building for a responsibility. He is growing up to something. Here in this world, the person may grow up to be a parent, a mother or a father. But somewhere in space, we are also growing up in responsibility. Somewhere along the line, we also have a job to do a destiny to meet. We have a great labor to perform for the cosmic good of which we are a part. And nature makes sure in her own way that before we are given more authority, we will learn to use what we have wisely. And the ambitious individual, by the perversion of his authority, comes back perhaps in a very humble estate because he has misused his privileges. The individual, before they, he can be trusted to go on to something better, must prove conclusively that he has the courage, the discrimination, and the dedication to live every day according to the light of truth. So the uh, testing is like the initiation rituals of antiquity. When a young person in those days wanted to devote his life to the service of the gods, or the deity of his community, he was first properly tested. He had to have certain basic knowledge. He had to have three arts or sciences at his control, preferably mathematics, music, and astronomy. These were the indispensables. And he was told when he studied them that he, he need not expect to make a nickel out of any of them. He might become a teacher, but if so, he would remain comparatively poor. What was necessary was that he should inwardly develop a discrimination, open a window or a door in himself so that something larger could be seen. Mathematics is revealed everywhere. Once you learn the principles, you can see these principles working in every flower, every bird's wing every crystal in the rock, everything. Mathematics is the open sesame to the laws of existence. Astronomy is the open door to the cosmos, the tremendous immensity of worlds and suns and stars, all of which bear witness to a sovereign intelligence 
a divine reality, an in infinite power which transcends all our understanding or our really our awareness. This is the power that ultimately, as we begin to understand a little more about it, brings us down on our knees in veneration for the plan which has made possible our own existence. And the third part was the music, the beauties, the harmony, the wonders, the joys of the arts, the uh, constant recognition that all of the creative arts are in turn laws working, that the laws of existence are most clearly indicated and most easily studied in mathematics, astronomy, and music. So when the young disciple reaches a point where he begins to look at things and looks into them at the same time, so that nothing whatever is meaningless any longer. There is no such a thing as a meaningless thing. If it is truly meaningless, it is a chimera or an illusion. It is not a thing. So from this point on, the student began to develop his integrities. He began to recognize his devotions and his dedications. And in due time, he was permitted to enter into the sanctuary and take his first initiatory rites. Here were the rites of purification, which must precede the meditative disciplines. The great baptismal rites of antiquity were the purification of the heart, mind, and the career, whatever it was, and their rededication to the principles of universal pr integrity. If the disciple was successful in passing this test, then he went through a discipleship. And finally, if he was able to pass successfully the tests along the way, which included physical problems, he had to show physical courage, control of pain, control of all impulses and appetites, control of his own thoughts and emotions. He had to prove that he was the master of his own soul. If he made this achievement and was given the full grade of initiation, then he took the obligation to use all that he had learned and every skill of his life and every value that he possessed in the service of the common good. Now, these types of dedications are not possible unless the individual has experienced something inside himself. It is very difficult for them, a Westerner today to think in terms of devoting or dedicating his skills only to the service of others. And yet, actually, that is their only value. But he has now commercialized all these things and made them increasingly difficult to share the problems of life. So we come into the meditational discipline and we then say to ourselves, how are we going to fit this in? How are we going to live this way in the kind of world we live in now? Well, many people have come to me. We've had a lot of talks on these problems. And folks have brought me all kinds of difficulties which they have faced. But looking them all over, I guess there have been hundreds of them, uh, certain things soon become obvious. The average person is never placed in a situation which is beyond his control. He may not control it, but he is never requested or required to do something that is beyond his capacity or his understanding. He is never do, is supposed to do more than live up to the best he knows. And if he lives up to the best he knows, problems have a strange way of curing themselves. Because the moment you take away from a problem all of your own mental, emotional involvement, the moment you stop being sorry for yourself, the moment you be, accept the rights of others to exist, and to appreciate their ways of life, when you stop doing things you shouldn't do, the problems get less and less. And this does not mean that you have to live under a different political administration. 
It doesn't mean that you have to change your religion. It doesn't mean that you have to give up your job. All that it really means is that you come a little nearer to the proper use of your faculties. You do not have to stop work. What's probably the most important is to learn to work because the average individual spends most of his time trying to figure out how to get out of his work. But uh, actually, he's not bringing him very much pleasure because he grudges every moment he spends there. But when his work is a dedication to meeting his share in the great cosmic plan of things, then work is fulfillment. If it is a domestic situation, which many of these situations are, then we find human selfishness, human attitudes, mistakes that individuals refuse to accept, and finally maybe the breaking up of a home that could have been saved if, if, if even one of the persons had really worked consciously and conscientiously to protect the situation. The same with children. Very hard these days to control the habits of young people. But it is gradually improving. And it, the, uh, when the individual, like the Hindu, realizes that he must pay his own debt to life by giving his own children as much care and attention as they need, regardless of whether he enjoys it or not, he will find that if he brings them up properly, they will be less and less problems. And if the problems do arise, the future will the child will be able to face them through its own experiences. Little by little, things can be brought into order if the person carries his full share of responsibilities and admits his own full share in the troubles with which he is surrounded. So there is really no great problem in trying to live a little better. It may be that some of the ultimates will be a little difficult, but then we are not faced with ultimates at the moment. Each person who makes one straight step forward in the course of his lifetime has fulfilled the purpose of his existence. The main thing is that he shall leave here a little bit better than he was when he got here. He must be enough better to have values, understanding, insights, and realizations that are more than he brought with him. He is not expected to be perfect, but he is expected gradually to recognize the importance of the inner life over the outer situations. Now, if he is doing what he should be doing, presumably, he will find also that when he settles down somewhere for a little quiet heart-to-heart -heart talk with himself, that he finds that he's pretty good company. He will find that he is someone who is easy to get along with, who does have dreams and hopes and aspirations. And he also begins to think in terms of the beauties of life, the beauties of existence, and his own share in them. Things are no longer unimportant because they are small, nor are they important because they have heavy debt attached to them. The individual gradually gets to the point where when he's kind of quiets himself down, things begin to look beautiful to him. He finds the inside of life very peaceful because the only reason it isn't peaceful is the outside of his own life. And when he begins to work toward that, he gradually achieves what you might term an almost permanent meditational state. It, uh, Swami, uh, Swami Vivekananda observed on one occasion, namely that the esoteric moods, the disciplines, the meditations, are essentially the continuing realization of the divine plan. Once the person uh, is able to think in these terms and little problems rise that hurt him, he finds solutions to them. He carries no bitterness. He is not disillusioned because to be disillusioned means to give up an illusion, not a reality. He is no longer constantly nagged by ambitions that are unfulfilled or responsibilities that have been avoided. He hasn't left anything un unfulfilled and he hasn't avoided anything. And as a result of that, 
as the Chinese said, in ancient times men slept without dreams. Dreams are to the most part anxieties which we face. Anxieties due to the things we didn't do that we should have done or that we did do that we shouldn't have done. And as soon as this situation begins to clarify a little bit and relax itself, the individual finds that he can sleep the sleep of the just and that all will go well. And that in the daylight and daytime, the peace of sleep will continue with him. He will be sleep awake. His life awake will be also gentle and peaceful and productive. There is so much in us that we never do anything with. And meditation is really a process of gradually coming into an intimate, constructive realization of our own natures. Meditation is the individual living continually in the light of inner courage, understanding, and peace. You find people trying to run away from themselves a great deal in our modern world. They want to escape of boredom. So the individual does all kinds of things, and some of the things he does are not reprehensible or anything. Uh, they're, they're the things that meaning something are meaning something at the moment. So he just spends one evening a week playing great bridge, and spends another day a week watching the football and baseball games, and he does this, he has all his friends in, he has very convivial times. He's always up to something. But with it all, what is he doing? Virtually nothing. He's trying to run away from himself. He's trying not to be bored. Here he has only a few years of life here in which to do all kinds of wonderful things. So he sits around watching lousy programs on television trying to get rid of the burden of existence. He just wants to get his mind off of himself. And now when you do that, you get your mind onto somebody else's troubles, almost certainly. So what is the, what is the answer? That the individual has a life of his own, and that meditation is living continuously in the light of inward realization. It is a, not a smug, comfortable feeling, but it is a deep realization of value. It is a way of doing it that is better. It is a way of growing that becomes beautiful. And it is a growing that is natural, just as the flowers of the, sea, village, of the valley and the garden grow because it is of their nature to grow. Man grows because growth is in him. It is his own nature. It is his own reason and purpose is to grow. <coughs> no one <coughs> tells him this. <coughs> no one forces him to grow. No one tells him he should, really, in most cases. But growth is the fulfillment. It is the being that we are gradually coming through the shadows of our own mistakes. It is the wonder that was given to us in the beginning, but in the presence of which we can stand in awe. Yet with all its greatness and its awesomeness, it is still a very simple thing, a common, reasonable way of life. So if we can gradually get this type of thinking we can also avoid most of the pitfalls that we face today when we do not know where to turn to find the answers to the questions that we want answers for. Instead of taking uh, the idea that uh, meditation is just going to get us to heaven in a very short time, or that any one of a hundred different schools of it uh, will get us there very promptly if we obey the rules. This is not, we must ask ourselves, what is this all about? Can any system take a person who is selfish and self-centered and irritable, can any system lift that individual by his own bootstraps? Is it possible for the person to take with him into the celestial regions all the unfinished business he has here? 
he is here to grow. If he doesn't grow, what are his rewards beyond? Why should he say, I can make all the mistakes I want to hear and enjoy blessedness somewhere else by a trick of the mind? He can't. He has to grow. And the mind is one of the wonderful instruments which will help him to grow. But he's going to have to be true to it if he expects it to be true to him. If he wants the mind to do things to help him to grow, he must never set it tasks that are unreal or unreasonable or unworthy of it. It is not, uh, it sounds uh, perhaps a little more difficult than it really is, because actually most people want to be happy. Very few people enjoy pain, whether it's physical, emotional, or mental. Very few people want to be in constant conflict with their world or their neighbors or their families. They would rather have a peaceful life. But in order to give up, or rather to gain this peaceful life, they have to give up some pet perversities of their own natures. In order to get this wonderful freedom that they need and want, and happiness, they've got to stop making mistakes that destroy the possibility of it. If we realize that, we find our destiny is in our own hands at all times. We can always be what we should be if we will be serious about it. Then, of course, in this type of thing, the seriousness of it gets to be a problem uh, sometimes. People work so desperately hard on trying to be good that sometimes it's almost wish they would be bad instead and everyone would be happier. <laughs> but actually, there's no need for this tremendous labor. There is no need for the individual to live constantly uh, by frustration to uh, knock out of his life the things he doesn't want to let go of simply in the term of being spiritual. So let's say, for instance, that to the mystic, the philosopher, the idealist, the religionist, in the truest sense of the word, goodness is finally normal thing. Goodness is the way it ought to be. Goodness is keeping truth and keeping trust and keeping faith with a plan which in all its parts is sublime. And good, being good, means to be essentially God-inhabited, God-possessed. For good, the word good comes from God. Also, it means that in being good, we are simply keeping the rules. And by keeping the rules, we will lengthen life, we will get over the danger of many ailments of the flesh, we will have more friends, better families, better children, and in the long run, we'll look back from the point of years with a great realization of achievement. Then when those years of retirement come, when the individual gives up a busy life, he is already a completely busy being inside of himself. Then he can settle back and contemplate more upon the wonders that have been meaningful to him. He can improve his knowledge and his insights. He can go further and further into the unfoldment of elements of his character which need special attention. And he can enjoy it. Be becoming a better person is a great hobby if you can only get used to it. It does more for us than any way that we can possibly plan a vacation. It is all finally to do the thing that needs doing and be glad when you see the wonderful consequences of doing it well. So we take a meditation is really a continuous obedience to the best of ourselves. It is the, the constant awareness that we are significant, that we are not so simply born to, to fail or born to suffer. We are here and are part of a great plan of victory, of success, of inevitable fulfillment. And with that type of thinking, uh, we will naturally begin to change our attitude. I've noticed in working with people who get into serious psychoneurotic situations that nearly all of them have bad backgrounds in relationship to life. One case that I know, a young woman back in the days of our parents who fell in love with a personable young man 
and the parents refused to sanction the marriage because she had an older sister and according to the rules the older sister had to marry first now this was a, a frustration the young woman had a broken heart really she probably really was sincerely in love and unfortunately for her the older sister didn't get married very soon so the whole situation fell apart 50 years later this same attitude was besetting this woman she could never forget it she could never do anything but say that her parents ruined her life well on the level of the occurrence that is true but there must be some way within ourselves to compensate for these hurts if we really want to she could outgrow it and could probably have found someone and had a very good life had she not settled down to being sorry for herself for half a century this doesn't help nature doesn't expect us to do that but as a result of this continued situation her whole life was miserable she had, was never able to be glad that uh, maybe that her sister did get married first I don't know all the details but anyway she could rise above it if she had wanted to now you can see that a girl of that age might not be able to rise above a serious hurt it could be done if the family itself had given her strong religious insights or if as she gained along through life she developed religious realizations or found good outlets for constructive attitudes but nothing happened she was locked now anyone who does this or just goes through this type of situation is a victim of his own mind we are all victims of the mind the only way that we can get over this is to make the mind an asset rather than a liability we can gradually learn to know that the mind is a magnificent instrument we should be grateful for it but we must use it wisely the poor workman always complains of his tools and nearly everyone who is making mistakes blames his own mind or somebody else's mind for his troubles the truth of the matter is the mind has to be educated in a very definite way not by necessarily the reading writing and arithmetic technique but by quietly recognizing the responsibilities and purposes of life the mind must have a dedication it must live in us for the purpose of fulfilling the divine plan that is locked within ourselves we are here to use the mind to advance our destiny to deny the mind is no use to say that it's always a fallacy is, is not true deity never presents a fallacy as a part of a structure in life it is the use we've made of it that has made it a dangerous instrument it is a an abuse of a power the only way we can correct that power is to correct its function we should not try to get rid of it what we should try to do is build upon it the fulfillment of the purpose for which it was created the mind is there to help us to grow we will be poor if we don't use it but we will be very poor if we abuse it so this meditation is really a kind of mental normalcy it is binding the mind itself to the convictions of the inner life just as the old mystic perhaps went into the monastery and gave his life to services of the poor so the mind has to make its dedication it must be assisted and stimulated to dedicate itself uh, to the proper service of the body which it inhabits and help the lead the being in the body toward the eternal truth for which it was intended the mind is a very valuable thing and any system which could pervert it or corrupts it or ties it to something less than itself is going to be ultimately a disappointment and a tragedy the mind must never be coerced it must be led quietly along ways of constructive living common sense is the beginning of this learning and by daily and in normal patterns being just a little more thoughtful every day a little more conscientious and a little more dedicated 
we will find the mind in the long run will bring us home in glory and we'll be very happy about the whole thing. In the meantime, I think we'd better close for the morning. Thank you very much.